so Apple has these in processors and um, I think at any given time, we probably, most of us go through some kind of, you know, what should I get? What do I need? What, uh, uh, you know, what do these processors mean? Especially as things go on. I mean, I, like, you know, go back to, go back to the, to the, to the nineties when we counted each little gain in megahertz as a thing and then eventually gigahertz. And I don't know, I have, I have no idea how fast the M2 or M1 processor is. And I've got an M2 MacBook pro. I've got an M1 ultra iMac studio. I've got an M1 iPad pro no idea how fast they are because Ironically, in part because, well, two things. Um, Steve Jobs, speaking of him, single-handedly redefined the way Apple was competing in the computer market, away from speeds, away from specs, away from price, towards lifestyle and design, but also because no one cares anymore, right? Processors have gotten so insanely fast that... Even cheap PCs can do the job that people who are good about buy cheap PCs need them for. Even cheap Android devices can do some things. Actually, I've got a cheap Android device. It's it's a pile of crap. But um, certainly, anything that's coming with an Apple logo on it is going to is going to to meet someone's needs. So I thought what we do is we just sort of like talk about the, 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 the general state of, of Apple's processors and what to think about. Cause I, I know that from, from past uh, events with this incredible group that a lot of us here keep our devices for a long time. Is, is that still the case? Linda, do you have a good feeling on that? I have to unmute. Um, some do. I mean, we, I, I think we cover the range in terms of the folks. I know of some folks that have quite old Macs that are still rolling along. And uh, I bought a new Mac studio, so I'm on the other end of the scale. I don't do that every time. But yeah, so we've got a range of, of people here. Got it. Okay. So the, the first and foremost thing is whenever you're buying, whenever you need a new computer, a new Mac or a new iPad or a new iPhone, get what you can afford and want. And at this point, from a hardware standpoint, I really don't think you can go wrong. Now, if you're doing heavy duty video processing, if you're doing heavy duty image processing, or if you're doing, you know, large batches of image processing, if you're doing any kind of scientific calculation, which I realize could certainly be some folks here, if you're doing any kind of uh, compiling or rendering, you probably want to get as much processor as you can absolutely afford. But I don't really think that applies to a lot of us here. It doesn't really apply to a lot of folks, which is one reason why the, the Mac Pro has been relegated to, you know, such a, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, like a, a pitiable state uh, almost. And um, in particular, now that we have the M1 and the M2, I think these processors are going to last a very, very long time. Like the M2, for instance, is 15% faster than the M1. It's not 15% faster than the M1 Ultra or the M1 Max, but it's 15% faster than the M1. That's certainly impressive. But from a we're using our computers standpoint, probably doesn't matter all that much. Well, one thing about the M2, and I, you know, we're still waiting for like the M2 Max and the M2 Ultra, uh, but one thing about the M2 is that it does do, uh, let me get the spec um, correct. Uh, the M2, I'm quoting from Apple, the M2 chip also features 100 gigabytes per second of unified memory bandwidth, which is 50% more than the M1 and supports up to 16 gigs of fast unified memory. That's something that may matter 
to more folks. And that's something that will, you know, probably keep the M2 more relevant for a longer period of time. But it doesn't make the M1 or the M1 Max or the M1 Ultra any less usable from a, a, a you know, day-to-day -day standpoint. Again, for probably almost everyone here. Maybe not everyone here, but for most of us here. Uh, you know, I... <laughs> I say that I do have an M1 Ultra iMac Studio. I, oops, I keep saying iMac. I said that twice now. Mac Studio uh, with 128 gigs of, of memory because I really, really needed it. Spoiler, I did not need it, but, you know, I, I, I wanted it, so I got it. Um, so it's maybe it maybe a little bit ironic for me to, to, to say it really doesn't matter, but it's almost like it, it's like we're in this funny stage right now where – the Mac that you can best afford is probably the best Mac for you. The iPad that you can best afford is probably the best choice for you, right? Because um, they're all super capable. And, it, you know, the, the form factor that you're most attracted to is probably going to be the best choice for you too, the 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 uh, screen size. I don't know. May, maybe that matters to you. Maybe like a, a lot of people really like the 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 iPad Mini, which does not have an in processor. A lot of people. I prefer. I have both an iPad Mini and the uh, previous generation of iPad Pro. I use my iPad Pro for almost everything, but that's me. I know people who just much prefer the the Mini form factor. Um, Either way, even the iPad mini, the current iPad mini that is sold is a more than capable device that's going to meet almost everybody's conceivable need for a portable tablet device. Um, and I'm kind of reminded, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's interesting to me when I think back to those days when Steve was wearing those, actually after even Steve stopped wearing these, uh, those, those Birkenstocks, and I think probably all of us remember the angst about Apple moving from power PT PC to Intel back in the uh, early 2000s. And a big part of that is because we, I certainly include myself, maybe not you uh, that's listening right now, but certainly me, I bought into yeah. Apple's hype yeah. So did Ichabod. He's only he's only two, but he remembers these days really well. But um, we bought into Apple's marketing message that the Power PC was better, and in many ways, the Power PC was better. But the reality is that once Apple moved to Intel, and once Apple made the software switch, you know, with the with Rosetta, which allowed Power PC apps to run on our Macs. Um, we soon forgot about the power PC and, you know, Intel was just fine. And again, we weren't really buying for megahertz or gigahertz or, or, or anything like that anymore. We were buying for, you know, lifestyle and design. And to think though, from those days when we were worried about PowerPC, because don't forget the, that Apple was one of the design partners with PowerPC. So once uh, Apple was one of the design partners with the AIM consortium, Apple, IBM, and Motorola. Apple was the, the, the involved in chip design at that time. And they would work with the engineers at IBM and they would work with the engineers at Motorola, at least until both of those companies sort of lost. Um, interest in doing those but even still to think about that you know at this point back in the, uh in the early 2000s intel was absolutely the king of chip design you know they were the king of speed they were the king of power and then to cut to apple making the decision to start making its own processors i think many of us worried whether or not that was actually going to be a thing and it turns out that it was a thing and that Apple is really good at designing processors, especially processors for its own devices. And when Apple announced the decision 
to start making M processors for its Macs. Again, I think some of us were maybe worried about whether or not Apple could do it. And it turns out that Apple really can and that these M1 and M2 processors are just freaking amazing. I mean, like Apple is just crushing everybody on the planet when it comes to chip design. And that's that's a really weird thing that I, I think it's really easy to take that for granted now. But I, I think if you had plopped all of us here down into a room 15 or 20 years ago and said, hey, do you think Apple should start making its own chips? So no, that's a terrible idea, you know, and, and, and so anyway, here we are today and they're making these great processors and they're fantastic. And the devices that they run on are fantastic. And I don't, um, uh, uh, actually like the, 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 the subtitle of this speaking thing was like, who needs them? The M1 and the M2, it's anyone and everyone, and you'll be fine with it. And if you buy it, whatever device you're going to have is going to last you for years and years and, and years to come. And I think that Apple will also be in a um, better place to support these processors as time goes on. Uh, meaning again, that it should, it should actually protect your, your investment into any Apple device that's using them uh, for a longer period of time. Um and so, like, the really short thing is these processors are great. Which one you need isn't the question. It's which one you can afford. And if you're looking at devices and you're thinking about which uh, what you want to buy, buy the one that you can best afford. And I think you're going to be just fine. Brian? Yeah. Um, I have two extrapolations from what you're saying. One is when you're when we're talking about people buying the best thing they can afford or whatever they may want, et cetera. It, it, to me, it's reminiscent of a car. I don't need a BMW to get from point A to point B. I could do that in a much less expensive car. I don't need a, a Polaris or a, or a Lucid or a Tesla or any of those. But there's something desirable about those cars, and that and people tend to buy them as a result of that. I see people doing the same thing vis-a-vis -vis Apple, perhaps including myself. I also have a Mac Studio. I don't need a Mac Studio, um, but that's what I bought. And I've, you know, there, there are, there's example after example after example. So I'm, is the whole market going in that sense towards the, the way the car market is that way? That it just, it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, my, my dear beloved husband bought an Audi. So from, from a Honda Civic to an Audi, right? So, so good for him. Yeah, right. I mean, it's great, but you get the point. It's like, it seems like computers are moving in that direction as well. Let me just stop there and, and let you comment on that. Well, yeah. I mean, there's still a lot of crap in the PC world, and there's certainly a lot of crap in the Intel world. Um, just, you know, devices that, you know, in, in Android in particular, devices that can't be updated and, you know, devices that have bare minimum of, you know, processor and RAM, devices that that have terrible screens, you know, things like that. There's there's definitely a lot of a lot of garbage devices that are out there. But I think that if you're spending any kind of reasonable amount of money on an Android device, on a PC, on a Mac, on an iPad or an iPhone, that you're probably going to have a device that'll last you as long as you want it to, uh, or at the very least for several years. I guess I, I sorry, that was a very presumptuous, my first statement was a very presumptuous one because there are people who certainly feel like their devices should work for 10 or 20 years and you know, more power to you if that's your thought process, but um, certainly that will last for many years in terms of what the industry currently considers to be standard. So yeah, I, I think, and 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 it's not it's not just Apple's processors that have exceeded the software demands that we throw at them. All like you know, most new devices far exceed the needs that the people who bought them are going to put them to. Again, there's exceptions to that. The renderers, the scientific people, the math people, the compilers, the, the, you know, the, the, the video uh, editors, 
uh, anyone who's doing professional graphics, uh, professional publishing stuff, there are definitely professional needs that need everything that they can get from any machine that they buy. But that's not most of us. Most of us, you know, we're going to do our email. We're going to uh, do our browsing. We're going to do Zoom calls these days, um, um, you know, maybe play some games and things like that. And, and most devices can handle most of what we throw at them. And I, 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 that's just the, I, I don't know, that's the bottom line, I think. Yes, sir. I see your hand. I'll unmute. Hi. Well, I just bought a Mac Air and uh, I had a MacBook Pro, which was terrific. Um, and as time went on, uh, actually, I even remembered Linda once made a comment uh, when something new came out, she had to get the newest and the best or whatever it was. It used to be in the back of my mind. The only reason uh, I bought the Mac Air, and I do I do like it, um, was that um, Mac, uh, uh, I could no longer uh, up, I could no longer upgrade uh, from Monterey. It was too old. It was working fine. And um, for me, as a, as a non-techie, uh, it was fine, but I kind of felt that Apple was going to be going in some direction, and I might as well be there with it. Um, so it certainly was good enough at that point. This one is has some new features and so on. I'm just saying that was that's very recent, about a month or so. Uh, and that was the only reason I upgraded. I assume it'll go in that direction in the future as well, as far as Apple is concerned. There'll be all kinds of new stuff that I can't imagine at this point. Well, congratulations on your new MacBook Air. Did you get the one with the M2 in it? Of course. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, the the sure. I, I think that the, uh, that reasoning to me makes perfect sense. And I think that it's wise. And I think that it's frankly smart. And I think it's probably pretty close to optimal. Uh, that that I th your process to me is like if, I, that's exactly what I would have mapped out for you. And the, the MacBook Air is such a great device and it's so light. And the, you know, it's gone from being the, you know, the cheap Mac to being like the light and powerful portable device. I mean, I, I went from I, the last several portables I've had have been Airs. This particular one, I got the uh, the MacBook Pro. And, and I would say that, that is sort of like the one caveat to almost everything I'm saying, which is always buy the most RAM that you can afford. Whatever device, if you have to get a slower device so that you can get more RAM, do that. Because it's RAM that is going to allow your device to last the longest. Because it's RAM requirements that, 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 that uh, expand as software continues to be developed and enhanced and, and improved. And I think that, uh, 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 especially when it comes to iPads, oh, excuse me, especially when it comes to, um, uh, to, to, to Macs, that you wanna get as much, as much memory as you can afford. Um, it, and within, uh, that the otherwise, that otherwise you really just can't go wrong. And even the probably there, you can't go wrong. Dave and Dave Hamilton, who my former business partner at the Mac Observer and um, uh, John F. Braun, his uh, co-hosting podcast partner at the uh, Mac Geek Gab did a, an episode a year or two or three ago. COVID has done like, like I have no idea how long any amount of time has been anymore at all. I think it was two or three years ago. They did an episode called Eight is Enough where they talked about eight gigs of RAM. They talked about eight gigs of RAM being enough. I personally think that 16 is, is much more closer to enough, that, but that could be because I generally have all of the tabs open like in my browsers and that's a, that's a memory gobbler. If you're better at managing your tabs than me, the eight probably is enough. So uh, yeah, anyway, M1, M2, buy the device you can afford. Buy the device that, that 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 looks good to you, that looks sexy, or looks powerful, or looks you know the uh, the uh, the the screen that you like, or the keyboard that you like. Don't worry about the processor so much; it's probably going to last you plenty of time. Do you see a reason 
if a person has an Intel machine that is still updatable, is there a reason to move from the um, Intel machine to the M chip? And as, a, as an, uh, an, uh, an analogy, if a person has, say, an A, what, 15 in an iPad to move to one with an M chip in it, do you see reasons to make those kind of moves? Definitely not on the iPad if it's working for you. Same thing with really a Mac. I mean, I, listen, I'm, I'm, Linda and I are, you know, she's my sister from another mister because uh, I also like to buy as much device as I can get, whether or not I need it. My catalog of what I currently own is, is the proof in that pudding. And, um, but the reality is that if your device is working for you, don't buy into the consumerism of needing whatever's the newest. If it's working for you, it's working for you. By definition, it is, it is, it is a fine machine for you. Now, there is certainly a point where you, you don't want to be sticking with a machine that can no longer get security updates. Security updates are very important. And, you know, Apple eventually leaves a lot of machines in the, well, excuse me, Apple eventually leaves everything in the dust, right? Everything eventually gets end of line or whatever it is that Apple's calling it. What's that called, Charles? Is it EOL still? That would be just simple obsolescence. Uh, um, yeah, fair enough. So, but at some point, Apple stops supporting devices. Um if that's the case, that's probably a good reason to to update. But if or upgrade to something, if, however, your device is working for you and you can still get security updates for whatever version of Mac OS or iPad OS that it supports, you're fine. Don't worry about any machine unless you want it. And if you want it, more power to you. And with respect to the M chips, um, some people thought, or maybe still think, that they are so much better than the Intel chips that there would be people in the enterprise, people in business, that would move in that direction. Do you see that? Or Yeah, the, have... I mean, the, the M processors are really good. And they're really good in terms of how much power they're they're consuming. The amount of power that Apple's delivering for power consumed, so like in you know processing power versus electricity consumed, Apple's killing everyone, especially Intel, and uh, which is you know great. The I I do think I think that the M1, starting with the M1, that they are significant upgrades over anything that's Intel. And I, I like, I would, I would so, so you know, I've been saying that, you know, whatever you can, whatever you can afford is probably the right machine for you. I wouldn't encourage anyone to buy an Intel based Mac pro at all, unless they just have to have it. Like, you know, they're doing production and their machine breaks or something like that. You should wait for whatever, you know, M, M2 ultra, or I don't know who knows what Apple's going to introduce, but, um, I, I would wait for an M processor Mac Pro. And the the the, the uh, Mac Studio is just a lot of machine. There's a lot of things that the Mac Studio won't do. It doesn't have the slots. You know, you can't add the extra cards uh, for whatever that's worth. You can't add, add the, uh, what's what's Apple's, uh, what's Apple's little box called? Uh, the external PCI box? Uh, no, I was thinking of the one that, that's for video rendering. Right. Oh, you mean the extra card that you could insert specifically to do video processing? Yes, from um, that is that is Apple an Apple product. I'm trying to remember what that's called. Maybe maybe it is the external uh, box. I thought it was something that went inside though. It goes mm. inside the Mac Pro, and it only goes inside the Mac Pro. That's the one I'm talking about. What is it called? The afterburner card. Yes, I think that's it. Yes, the afterburner card. I mean, yeah, you, it, 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 if you need the afterburner card and, and whatever, get you know, get that get that new Intel Mac Pro because you got to have it right now. But I would certainly wait, especially with them being rumored to be in the first quarter of uh, of two thousand twenty three. I would I would do my best to wait for that if I was in the market for a Mac Pro. 
So moving with another extrapolation, and I have not seen anything on this, and I'm, you, I'm pretty good at, you know, I have, obviously I do news things for everybody every, every month. Um, but given the energy use improvement, comparing the Intel chips versus the M chips, if I were running a large corporation, something like a ConAgra or a Cisco or a, um, you know, someplace where you buy lots of machines, would it pencil out in energy savings to move to M chips? Who knows? No, you don't think so. I haven't done that math. I haven't even. Yeah, I haven't either. And I've, I've, I haven't seen but anybody. Be, yeah, go ahead. I'd I'm be sorry. flabbergasted if it did. Okay. Like right. the, the the real issue that you've got with power consumption to me is the power consumption for the battery on a Mac, uh, uh, some kind of MacBook. Uh, that's where that's going to matter the most. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm happy to to not be spending Intel levels of power on the Mac Studio that's on my desk. That's for sure. But I don't. I can't imagine that, that it would like pay for itself or anything. I don't know. Maybe maybe here in California where electricity prices are so high. I'm just wondering if the different, I mean, if you're, if you're a big company and you're running thousands of PCs yeah. versus thousands of, if you don't, I mean, accounting firms, as far as I know, still need, you know, there's only accounting software for Windows, sure. but um, sure. I'm, I, it's a wondering that I had and I, I just, yeah, it's just a wondering. If you run across anything like that, shoot me a link. I will, <laughs> I will do that. Um Gonna ask the 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 Jeff Butts over at TMO to maybe try to track that down and, and do some uh, do some math on that. Yeah. Just as a simple comparison on that uh, with the iMac, the Intel iMac typically would run up to I believe 150 watts of power, whereas the Apple Silicon iMac runs 50 to 75 watts of power, so half to a third of the power consumption. Yeah, but how? Um, what is that in dollar terms? That's going to depend on your electricity rates. Well, right. So let's say it's 30 cents a, a kilowatt hour. I mean, you know, are we, it, it's great to be saving, you know, 66% off your, your electricity consumption, but if it's $5 versus $15, I don't know that that's going to make a lot of difference for uh, a lot of folks. I don't know, it could be yeah, wrong. On a per month basis, it's probably not that far off. Like 10 bucks a month? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, 10 bucks a month is 10 bucks a month. So yeah, multiply that over a thousand. But you know, so let's say it's 10 bucks a month. So you've got uh you've got a company with 10,000 computers and 10 bucks a month, that would be a hundred thousand dollars a month. And I don't know, I guess that certainly is 1.2 million a year. Yeah, but that would not be the driving force for it, but it would certainly mm -hmm. be a pretty significant factor. Oh, yeah, interesting. fair enough. Interesting thought, Linda. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that really isn't a long conversation. I mean, and, and uh, purposely so. Uh, it's they're great, and they're going to last a long time. And get the one you can afford, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So in a similar vein with that sort of thing, you were mentioning the whole notion that people were not as certain if Apple could actually produce a proper Apple Silicon uh, chip for the Macs. But at the same time, Apple is producing Apple Silicon chips for the iPhones and iPads for the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, where would there be a difference in the threshold between those? I mean, the major thing that people were noting was the fact that I believe it was the A13 or A14 they were seeing performance figures on that that were outweighing laptops on the Intel side. At which yeah. point, I think people were saying it was inevitable that there was going to be Apple Silicon in Macintoshes. Yeah, I think I, I, I think that a lot of us did consider it to be inevitable and really inevitable from a control standpoint, right? Apple loves controlling um, every aspect of its devices that it can. So yeah, that makes sense. But at the same time, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Charles, when I said that um, there was some doubt about whether or not Apple could, I, I don't necessarily mean from folks like us. 
but I, I, I think more like from folks who were still definitely in the, you know, Intel is best camp. Uh, you know, I, I mean, Apple still doesn't get its just due in how, how powerful the processors are in the iPhone. Like, you know, Apple made that the jump to 64 um, bit processing and they made it look so easy that no one uh, it's in the mainstream, you know, people weren't really talking about it. I mean, and, and it, it was this huge, massive triumph. And Apple was so far ahead of everybody else when it came to, to moving to 64-bit processing. So, yeah. Um, the, 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 the skill sets that went into, if, if there was a question, it was a question of whether or not the skill sets that allowed Apple to make great mobile, low power consumption uh, processors would lend itself to making the kind of desktop uh, computing power needed for a desktop class processor. And, uh, you know, obviously that ended up being a non-issue. Am I actually addressing your point, Charles? Yeah. At the very outset, at the very least, on things working in the office, the direction on that. Right now, it seems the only thing actually preventing that are those people who are saying that they must have Windows compatibility on things. Nope, I have yeah. to have an Intel-based machine, even if it is a Mac Apple product, uh, because I need to do boot camp or Windows emulation or that sort of thing. Other yeah. than that, I think it's just been outclassed by the Apple Silicons in all aspects. Yeah, I, 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 that's how I see it. I, I, like, Intel should be embarrassed, and Apple is just kicking their butts all over the corporate space. And, um, uh, yeah, it. it I'm reminded. A lot of this reminds me of Eric Schmidt, former um, Google CEO uh, of Google, who basically said that Apple should leave Maps to Google because doing Maps is really hard, and. I don't know if he believed that or if that was a marketing statement. I mean, don't get me wrong. Doing maps is hard. And Apple did flood the rollout of maps. But turns out that Apple was able to figure out how to do maps. And Apple was a, you know, Apple's been able to figure out how to do almost everything that Apple has set out to, to figure out how to do. And that apparently includes processors too. But I am sure that there were folks in Intel who were saying, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't actually know this. This is an assumption, but I think it's a good assumption that uh, we're saying that Apple should leave making processors to us. And Apple said, no, thank you. You know, we tried to get you for, uh, uh, you know, many, many, many years to pay attention to your own power consumption and you wouldn't do it. And so because you wouldn't do it, we're going to go ahead and, and, and solve that. And it turns out that Apple was actually pretty good at solving that. So I don't know. It's, it's, there are so many things that Apple is doing that would be like generational successes for every other company. And most of them sort of get, you know, just taken for granted by certainly by the mainstream and, and to a lesser extent, even by, by folks like us, you know, there are all kinds of things that Apple is doing that we, we just take for granted anymore. And, uh, you know, cause Apple just makes it look easy and the rest of the industry has largely not been able to copy them in, in, in a lot of those regards. And I find that fascinating. I, 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 I feel like there's a lot of what that Apple is doing under Steve and that what Apple did under Tim that should be like the subject of, of, of uh, uh, PhD uh, uh, doctorates for, for many years to come. But I don't know if that's actually going to be the case, but it, it's what it feels like to me. You're muted. Still muted. Still muted. You're muted. Linda. Okay. 
from a from a, okay from a technical standpoint or from a um, business standpoint or both. Oh, both. I, I, what Apple's done with its supply chain, what Apple has done with the environment in its supply chain, like you know all the ways in which uh, Apple has uh, worked to. I think one of the things that they talked about in the past. I haven't. I haven't. I don't. I haven't caught anything recently specific to this, but Apple at one point was bragging about how uh, they were getting water consumption and water um, uh, wastewater disposal and and doing all these things in ways that uh, vastly surpassed the requirements of local regulation, especially in emerging markets where you know there often are no regulations. Uh, those kinds of things that Apple does are amazing. The, the way Apple invents machinery and invents processes, that it then has its supply chain actually execute or to work with its supply chain to develop these things. Those, the, 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 there have just been like untold numbers of miracles in terms of things that have been invented to, 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 to get these devices in our hands and on our desks and on our laptops, our laps, on laps. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, and, and I, a lot of those stories are probably never going to be told. That's for sure. But the 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 moving moving to its own processors, moving the Mac to its own processors, like Apple has now twice changed processors on its desktop product line and made it easy. You know, with relatively few hiccups, hangups, problems. Uh, 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 the, 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 those are those are just these massive successes. And I don't, I don't think Apple gets enough credit for it. Um, and maybe Apple likes that just fine because uh, it, it means that, you know, the rest of the, the rest of the world isn't really paying attention to all of the things that Apple is doing and, 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 you know, and, you know, might, it might make their competitors a lot more relaxed than they should be. I don't know. I don't know that that's the yeah. case, but that's definitely a thought that occurs. We already have one example of that uh, in Thunderbolt. Apple helped IBM put that together as a reasonable technology. I think it was IBM, um, but allowed Intel specifically to take the overall control of that until it was turned over to a standards body. And because it was Intel pushing it and not Apple, the rest of the industry accepted that as a cross-platform standard. So wait, Thunderbolt or Firewire? Or both? Both, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 true. But 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 there's also lots of like manufacturing things where Apple does this, where Apple's out there inventing how to do something, but then allowing the supply chain to actually do the execution. And that, I mean, that's something that that that, that at this point Apple is singularly good at, apparently. And uh, uh, and I, it, with, with the rest of the world, all focused on just taking what they can get from the supply chain and then making the best that they can from that, you know that's that's a big part of why our iPhones are you know so much better than even Samsung uh, Samsung's devices or even Google's devices in my opinion. Uh, so. Um, uh, it, and I, 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 I really don't think Apple gets the credit that it deserves. And I find that it's, it's interesting to me. It's interesting to me that certainly that the Wall Street doesn't pay more attention. But, you know, that, that sort of actually just kind of brings me back to something that I've said for a long time that, that, that you know, for years and years and years, Wall Street was wrong about Apple. And then Wall Street became right about Apple, but for all the wrong reasons. You know, a big part of Wall Street has never understood Apple. They've never understood the the value proposition that Apple brings to its customers. They've never understood the 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 value proposition of the you know the whole widget. Um, um, and I, I feel like like when all of the analysts turned bullish on Apple, a whole lot of them didn't didn't understand why they should have been bullish all along and didn't understand why they were turning bullish. They were turning, it was like, you know, just a bunch of bandwagon jumpers. So um, yeah, anyway, that was 
thought out of left field. Yes, Linda? Um, Gene Munster, who gets so much flack for having been wrong about the Apple TV, he was one that was right way early. And a lot of people followed him just for just to, you know, to pick a name. Um, there's also the gentleman from Fortune, whose name escapes me right this minute, who has an Apple blog, Apple 3.0 or something like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Philip, he's a press guy. Philip, De- uh, Philip Albert DeWitt. Yes. Right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. OK. He, he's another one, although he's not technically an analyst. Um, but I think <laughs> they, but- they pay attention to earnings per share. Yeah. I mean, that's what they pay attention to is the numbers. Well, and, and, and they, yeah. they pay attention to getting their sources out of out of China, right? And you know, trying to trying to figure out what Apple's doing based on those sources. Uh, and sometimes they're more right and sometimes they're less right for sure. But right. the, the 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 I mean, like, you know, even Gene Munster though, Gene Munster was not wrong about the TV. Right. I mean, Apple was working on a TV. We've eventually found out that Apple was working on a TV and then Apple got to the point where they realized that they couldn't control enough of of what they were developing to be able to maintain their position uh, after they released it. And so Apple then put the kibosh on it. Uh, So I think think Gene needs to get even more credit personally. He just, I mean, when you mentioned his name among people who have followed it for a while, yeah, he, he, there's, a, there's a lot of, oh, he's going wrong, you know, whereas yeah. he was yeah. actually at the beginning. I mean, at the beginning, he was one of the first ones that said, watch this company, watch this company. So he, he, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, yeah, I, I will say this. Listen, I mean, I do kind of follow what the analysts are saying. Uh, I don't don't often report on it, but I do follow it. And they are now more and more pointing to the customer uh, loyalty. So you do hear that more and more, and that's that finally has begun to dawn. Whereas, way back at the beginning, when all of us, or most of us anyway, probably all of us, were Apple fanboys and girls, you know, and that that loyalty, that dedicated loyalty, that helped pull Apple out of the you know the original the bad old days. So that's they finally figured out it. Oh, you know, so that that that's a big part of it. We kept buying, you yeah. know, and and others joined in. So. Yeah, anyway, enough of that. But at the same time on that, I would say that Wall Street starts and ends with the dollars involved and how much profit it actually makes the company. So a lot of those things that makes Apple better are soft items that don't necessarily directly translate into better profit or better stuff. The better experience is the bridge towards that. The better experience makes you want to buy the product, which generates more profit on the things. But beyond that, you look at a number of the other items. We're only just starting to see those, you know, like the ESG side of stuff fit into the overall financial picture. Sure. Well said. Anyone else have any questions or comments? How long am I speaking? Linda? Data wait. <laughs> You're muted again. You're muted again. Sorry, I keep doing that. Um, <laughs> technically, it would be 8.15, but uh, I also stopped early. So you've probably done the, the, the time allotted, but it, so if people have questions or okay. you have more, that's fine. And if not, you know, we don't have to Happy to yeah, yeah. happy to entertain yeah. any kind of conversation anyone wants to have. Yeah. Uh, I did see a question. Yes, sir. Did I, did I hear you say that Apple was going to go back to the USB uh, for some reason? I it's thought that's what you said a while ago. Oh, was that only in Europe? I heard you say something like that. Oh, it's the USB-C connector to the iPhone. USB. It's oh, USB-C. It's still USB-C. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, currently on our iPhones and some, I, well, on my iPhone anyway, we have lightning connectors. Um, Europe has passed a law that says that in 2024, all devices have to have USB-C instead. Oh, so really? For the, for, yeah. So on the iPhone, the, the iPhones that they manufacture from 2024 on will, will be required to have USB-C as connectors for charging. Does that mean that they... Uh... 
Does that uh, mean that they uh, need to, uh, they just can't give you an adapter? Correct. Oh, really? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, does uh, that suggest that if I, does that suggest that a, that a, a good, uh, a good idea would be, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I have an iPhone which has 5,000 cracks in the back, but there's no reason to change it except that it someday will disappear. But it sounds like maybe a cool move would be to wait for a few months before I buy, before I replace it. So I'll get a USB-C connector. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I don't know. I'm sorry, Linda. You're muted. I, I, I don't, I, I, am I muted again? No. Nope, you're good. Um, you don't you can do it either way if just because you have one if you buy one i mean i just bought a 14 pro and it has a uh a lot the old if you will lightning uh connector i wouldn't wait if you need a new iphone because you'll you'll still be able to charge using this the law just simply says from anything they sell from i believe it's 2024 on they have to put in the USB-C connector it's sort of uh, my ipad has a USB-C connector so does my uh macbook air and it's an intel machine is so, it january 1st or is it october 31st i don't know the date i just yeah, know it's 2024 yeah so it could be i mean the, the reality is like uh, this is definitely uh one of my pet peeves it's been several years since apple started moving to USB-C for the ipad and as well as for the MacBook and the MacBook Air and the MacBook uh, uh, Pro line. And yet I have to have two different kinds of cables because I also have an iPhone. It's, it, I expected Apple to move to USB-C on the iPhone years ago. I'm sure there's a reason for it. And that reason could well be the amount of space that USB-C takes up inside the device as well as the amount of space, you know, these ports are bigger, but they're not that much bigger. I don't know. I, I'm sure there's a technical reason for it, but Apple sh should bloody well move everything to USB-C. The, the, my only problem with Europe's action here is that before USB-C, Every other version of USB sucked, especially for phones. Micro USB remains terrible. And for the for uh, European Union to lock devices into USB-C means that if a company like Apple can make something that's better, they can't use it. And that drives me nuts. You know, I, I, I personally believe that there should always be tension between regulation and the free market. If, if, if you have too much regulation, you you tend to have uh, capitalism tends to, to wither. If you let capitalism run amok, capitalism run amok and runs amok. And that, that, that where the sweet spot so far over the last 150 years or so has been when you've got enough regulation to keep people protected and enough freedom to allow capital to do what it does best, which is to innovate and, and, and try to make money and things like that. This is one of those things that I think is over-regulating. I think that people can handle the charging port for their device. And I think that lightning was vastly superior to what was available uh, before USB-C. And that if Apple hadn't been able to, like uh, an iPhone with micro USB would not have been as pleasing an experience to us as iPhone owners. And uh, I, I worry about, I worry about forcing the industry to this, to this, this one standard that in 2024 will at that point be three or four or five years old. Right. Right. You know, so what about USB D or you know whatever it's going to be called or or or, or again some something that's proprietary that is superior to USB C Apple won't be able to use it in Europe so will, will that mean that Apple also won't use it in Asia and also won't use it in the United States I don't know but that the potential for that has me a little bit frustrated uh, regardless the practical question is 
I don't think we'll see USB-C on our uh, on a new iPhone until 2023 at the earliest. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of the way the European Union regulation is structured. I don't know, for instance, if anything that's introduced, say in 2023, can continue to be sold through throughout 2024. Or if starting January 1st, everything has got to, you know, every in 2024, January 1st, everything has got to have USB-C. I don't know which that is, but uh, we won't be seeing USB-C on an iPhone until the 15 at the very earliest. And it could even be the 16 in 2024. So if your current device with its chipped back is working for you, keep it and use it. That's my thought. Okay. Other Any questions? other thoughts? Well, let me give you a closer then. Yes. Uh, going back to the M chips on things. Um, we've had the M1 and it was a fantastic revolution on things. We've got the M2, which was largely iterative on that. Um, yep. Be a prognosticator. Where do we go from here? Are the subsequent future M chips going to be just better, stronger, faster? Or is there something more that you see coming from them. Charles, that's man coming from you, dude. What are you what are you trying to tell us, man? <laughs> what are you trying to tell us? I what, what, the, the question is going to be is what is going to be in the in the Mac Pro? Right? I don't think Apple could just stick an M2 Ultra in the Mac Pro and call it a day. Like it feels to me that Apple needs to be able to run multiple M2 Ultras or whatever it is that goes into the Mac Pro in series or in parallel, which would it be, Charles? That would be parallel. Okay, so you know, running in parallel, thank you, um, uh, to really be able to kind of offer the, the, the kind of power that, that, that would make the Mac Pro form factor reasonable. So... What Apple ends up doing to the Mac Pro will then, it, it, it's because it's it's funny when, when we started getting rumors of the M processor, I thought there was a chance because we've been waiting so long for an update to the Mac Pro. I thought there was a chance that Apple was actually going to start with the Mac Pro in an M processor, and it turned out that wasn't the case because we're still waiting for uh, an M uh, uh, processor Mac Pro. But then we did get that fancy uh, Intel update to them. So once the Mac Pro moves to an empowered device, it seems to me that that's what's going to start trickling down to the rest of the uh, uh, the, the, the the rest of the uh, the Mac product family uh, as time goes on. And I don't know what that's going to look like, other than again to say. That I don't just think it'll be, you know, sticking an M an M2 Ultra. You know, the, the Mac Studio will have the M2 Ultra or the M2 Max. Or was was there a third? Was is there an is there get another one? I know we have the Max and the Ultra. Is there like a and the Pro? And the Pro, thank you, and the Pro, and then the regular, the, the regular M2 and the regular M1, right? You got the yeah, get four the levels. Four levels, thank you. So uh the uh, yeah, it's it's all going to depend on what happens with the Mac Pro, and I I I don't know, I, I I don't know, but it needs to be it needs to be awesome. So, um, I think that Apple will deliver something that's awesome. I mean, I can, I guess you know it could be like like <laughs> the M2 Ultra Max, the M2 the M2. M2 Ultra 2, uh, Ultra Plus. I don't know. We could we could kind of go that kind of where it just has even more cores and it and it supports even more memory. But the um uh, uh the way the M processor has memory that's embedded into the 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 the, the, the chip itself is not the way that the Mac Pro has ever worked. So is Apple going to accommodate that? Is Apple going to release some kind of M processor that allows third party or I'm sorry, excuse me, external RAM? And what would that look, look like? I don't know. Um, but if if these if the current rumors are true and we're expecting that in the early part of of, of Q1, can't wait to see it. How's that for a cop out finish? 
I was mainly curious. I mean, as we get up in further generations of processors, it's always been, you know, this one is faster. This one can do more memory. This one can chop vegetables, maybe. Um, but the action, there's other innovations that have come in, like the M process. I think it was before the M processors. Apple is starting to toss in machine learning uh, cores. Yeah, metal which and was a engine. fairly new idea. Or like they had high power cores and low power cores going into the same chip so you could get high efficiency under most circumstances but high uh, processing power when you needed it on that i was curious if you see anything in those realms or any possibilities that might go into future chips well okay to, to that extent yeah um because like the neural engine that is in the the m family is is super powerful what what are we going to see once apple actually introduces its um uh virtual reality aug augmented reality uh, glasses right is, is there going to be is there going to be some additional processing on the uh you know, who knows what's going to actually power the glasses themselves but uh, i would imagine there's going to be that it seems like glasses would be paired to a device probably an iphone so maybe we'll start seeing yet yet another module that's de that's dedicated towards processing that kind of information. Apple has shown that when they when they have a new need, they will add something to their own processor to take care of that, which again is something that doesn't seem like anyone else is doing. Maybe they can't. Maybe they maybe they figured out. I don't I don't know, but. Uh, the metal and then the neural engine and the uh, the you know the, the, the secure enclave uh, 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 all of these things are essentially like modules that are being shoehorned into Apple's own processors and surely we can expect more of that as time goes by to Charles's question uh, I just don't know necessarily what it'll be I would I would imagine the next thing that we'll see will have something to do with the uh, with the goggles glasses hopefully it'll be glasses not goggles Anything else? Okay. Yeah, I think. Are we? Are we let Brian go take care of his puppy dog. Uh, listen, I love you, folks. I love speaking here. Uh, I love talking to you and, and hearing what you have to say. It's always a privilege to be able to uh, be part of any meeting that you're doing, and uh, I really appreciate that. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for your input. That's really, really fascinating stuff. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'm okay, going thanks, to Brian. turn my camera off and listen. Bye, everybody.